Okay, so let's go ahead and go through the rest. Okay, we can skip this part. That's just part of the cross bleed start procedure. And we're into before taxi. Okay, and let me see. I've got to also have a ground crew, F8, ground air supply, disconnect, F2. So it's just going to go down there, disconnect the fitting. By this time, that the fitting would be very, very hot. So gloves are always in order. Although that even doesn't always help. So we'll assume that they've got everything disconnected down there. And, okay, before taxi, we get into a check right off the bat. Generator crossover relay check. Left chin off, and then on. Okay, so this is just going to be a check of the electrical system to make sure that, in this case, when the left generator is off, that the right generator picks up the load. Okay, so it says left chin off. It doesn't really tell us specifically what to check, does it? Obviously, I get the lift generator light on, and I'll put it back on the line. Actually, I'll go reset, and then put the lift generator back on the line. That's not really much of a, a check there, is it? Now, there's got to be more to the story. Let me think about that for a second. I'll be right back. And this is probably as good a spot as we're going to get to have a good look at the electrical system. Now, controls in the cockpit, we have a battery switch, the left and right gen switches, and then the circuit breakers that are in three places around the cockpit, and we've already seen those, or at least seen where they're at. Now on the simplified schematic that we have in the DCS manual, this is identical to the one that's in the Real Dash 1. We have those three switches, we have the uh, battery right here, right generator switch right here, left generator switch right here. So what happens is when the battery is on, the DC, 28 volt DC, direct current bus, is energized, coming off the battery, through the battery switch, and then just straight to the uh, bus bar that supplies power to these systems that we have listed right here. So everything in this column is powered. Now in addition, we have off of that DC bus a static inverter. So it comes off the bus to the inverter, and that's going to convert that 28 volt direct current into 115 volt alternating current. And that's what allowed us to do the fuel and oxygen quantity check, and that's what also powered the engine ignition system. And then during the startup release, the left hand engine instruments. So now, of course, we have the battery on, and then we have the left and right generators on. Now the battery was direct current, the generators are going to provide alternating current, AC. So we have the generators up here at the very top. Once the left hand generator switch goes on, it completes the circuit and provides power to the left hand AC bus and that's going to power everything that is listed right here. Once the right generator switch goes on it completes that circuit and provides power to everything on the right hand list. And then both generators have a transformer rectifier. This is basically going to take the alternating current and convert it into direct current. So both sides, once the generators are running, then power the 28 volt DC bus and then also take the load off of the battery and charge the battery. So this is the setup that we have right now. Okay, so knowing that, it says generator crossover relay check, lift gen off and then on. So with a little bit of knowledge of the system, this makes a whole lot more sense because now we're going to have something that we can actually check. Now I'm going to go lift gen off and the crossover relays that it talks about and I'll come back up here to the schematic. Then the lift generator switch is off. It de-energizes the crossover relay. That's actually it right there on the schematic. When that de-energizes, this part of the circuit closes. So now, from the right-hand generator, power is running down these lines through the crossover relay circuit, and then the right-hand generator powers the left-hand system, and vice versa for the right generator. If the right generator switch goes off, the relay de-energizes, closes the circuit, and then the left-hand system would provide power to the right. So how do we know then that it worked? And we're just going to use a couple of items from the left-hand list here. So a good candidate would be, you know, armament panel lights. You know, if I can come over here to the armament light control and the lights come on, I know the power is on the left-hand system, even though the left-hand switch is off. Another good one would be left hydraulic pressure indicator. So if the indicator up here goes down to zero, then I would know that that relay is not working. It's still a very, very odd check to me. Why would you check the left relay, but not the right relay? But, and I'll reset the generator and then reapply power. And we have the generator light off. And the next step is circuit breakers check, just to make sure that we didn't run into any overload conditions. 
with too much power being pulled through there. Yeah, it's a very strange shake to me, but then again, I'm looking at it from the point of view of a maintainer. For pilot, well, I guess that's all you get. Okay, so we'll go ahead and press on from there, and that's, well, that takes care of the electrical system at least. I'm glad that I paused there and, and did dig into that. Hopefully all that explanation made sense. And we're on to anti-G suit test button press to test. Check anti-G suit for proper inflation deflation. Now the button is actually back here. Obviously it has no function, but you would press that and then your anti-G suit, if you were wearing one, would be inflated. But we'll leave that. And then radar mode selector off or standby. And then we have a warning. Ensure radar mode selector is at off or standby to avoid danger to personnel. Because if we put it to the operate position, the radar is actually going to transmit. As far as I can tell, there's no, like, override that occurs with weight on wheels. That's a common thing to happen on other aircraft. But on the F-5, from what I can tell reading the manual, we can, sure enough, operate the radar on the ground. I'm just going to leave that off for now. But we do have a check of that coming up. And then caution, during ground operations, do not leave the radar mode selector in operate, standby, or test for more than 10 minutes to prevent radar malfunction from overheat. If necessary, turn the radar off until immediately prior to takeoff. And that's just due to not having ram air going to the system for cooling. I guess this is another good opportunity to look at at least part of the ECS system. So yeah, here on the schematic, we have electrical equipment and radar cooling. And what would happen, yeah, ram air inlet up here, so air would enter, go through a heat exchanger, and get conditioned into cool air, and then come down here to cool the avionics and the radar. So since we're not actually getting that ram air due to not moving forward, we don't have any cooling going to the radar, so we need to leave it on no more than 10 minutes. And then we get into a series of... A flight control checks. It starts right here, this little sequence. Let me read through this real quick so I can make this part go a little bit quicker and a little bit more streamlined. I'll be right back. Okay, so step 5 through, pretty much step 5 through 11 is going to be done in conjunction with the ground crew. So I would be in communications either visually or more than likely through the voice communications and the intercom. I'm going to start with speed break in and check that the speed break for tracks and the horizontal tail trailing edge moves up to check the speed brake and horizontal tail in interconnect. So speed brake controls in the cockpit are right here on my throttle. I have that mapped. And then the crew chief is going to be behind us checking the horizontal tail. And what I'm going to do is hop out and sort of play crew chief here for a second. And to do this, I went left control F11. Then I can just use my mouse and my mouse wheel to move around. Okay, so I still have control of the cockpit. Okay, so speed brake's coming up. And yeah, I can see the tail moving if you look closely. Yeah, so that's a good check. Okay, the next part of the check was to run through some operation of the flaps. So I'll come back up here. And now we have flap thumb switch M slash auto. Flaps should extend to full. Verify that horizontal tail trailing edge moves down as flaps extend. So flap controls over here on my throttle. I have the thumb switch right here. I'm going to move it aft two clicks to the auto position and again let me go left control F11 get out of the cockpit and play crew chief although it wouldn't necessarily have to be the crew chief that does this other maintenance disciplines weapons avionics do occasionally get qualified as the what's called the a man or the guy that's in charge of the aircraft launch and that communicates with the pilot and all this stuff it's not that common but it's just a neat thing to do it just makes yourself a lot more useful especially when it comes time to pick people for TDYs for air shows or just other trips that are nice to go on. The more that you know and the more that you know how to do, the more likely you are to be able to tag along. Now, on the thumb wheel, I'm moving it back. Okay, that was two clicks back. That's the automatic position. And yeah, the trailing edge, I'll do that again. Yeah, the trailing edge moves up as the flaps retract and moves down as the flaps come down. And what should have also happened there, and I'll come around to the front, yeah, we can see that the leading edge came down as well. So I'll take that as a good check of the flaps. I'm just going to leave them there in the auto position, the thumb wheel or thumb switch. I might have been calling it a wheel all this time. But the switch is in the aft position. That's just the auto setting. Okay, damper switches, yaw and pitch. So pitch damper. Okay, there's pitch and yaw on. Pitch damper cutoff check. So pitch damper cutoff switch actuate. And the pitch damper switch moves to the off position. The cutoff switch disengages the pitch damper only. When the ground switch is checked from the ground, a small jump in the horizontal tail may be evident. Now the disconnect is around here on the other side of the stick, this little lever that we can see right there. I'm going to do the lever, okay, pitch trips off, 
And the next step is to pitch damper switch back to pitch. If the horizontal tail moves when the pitch damper is re-engaged, the malfunctioning pitch damper is indicated, disengage the pitch damper. So again, I would be in communication with the crew chief and I would put the pitch up and just verify that the tail did not move. And then flight control check. Now I'm just going to move the flight controls, the stick and rudder, through their range of motion and I'll do this from the external as well. So I would just find a nice little place back here where I could kneel down and see everything. So pilot's going to go stick left. I would say lift up right down, stick right, right up left down. Pilot goes aft stick, I would say pitch up. Pilot goes stick forward, I would say pitch down. Pilot goes rudder left, I would say rudder left. Pilot goes rudder right, and I would say rudder right. And that, I believe, is the rest of the check, okay? The only other thing is pitch trim, check and set. So at this point, I want to go ahead and set my pitch trim to the value that we calculated earlier, or eight increments up. So pitch trim, I'm just going to use the trim hat here on my stick. I have all that stuff already mapped. I'm just going to pitch up until this is at eight. And this cockpit, I saw on the forums, I was about to report it, but somebody already beat me to it. It's the same thing that, it's actually, I think a lot of aircraft that do this, it's really a shame because you hit sort of like a, a floor that you just can't go below and I just can't really yeah I just can't get well I have to lean way back to do that hopefully it gets fixed it's just one little number in a file we'll have a link to how to fix that but and I know it's early access and everything but I mean did nobody really really notice that oh well okay so we'll call that good that's set at eight aileron trim check and set is required and I would just do a check of the trim and I would also verify that the crew chief can see the ailerons and the horizontal tail control surfaces move as I do that so I'll take that as a good check of the trim okay then for the altimeter we have a quick check that we do I'm going to go since we have the AAU 34 to the electrical setting so that's a left click okay the pneumatic flag goes out and I'm just going to set it I'll take it that 2992 was the altimeter setting for this mission I didn't check and I'm not going to bother calling ATC. But the next step is to position it to pneumatic and then check that the flag is visible and the, the indicated altitude is within plus or minus 75 feet. So let's go ahead and go for, okay, right click pneumatic. I've got the flag. And yeah, I'll call that a good check. And I'll, I believe I reset it and then go back to the electrical setting. And I'll read ahead here. Yep, yeah, there we go. Place it back to the electrical setting. Check that the pneumatic flag is not visible and that the indicated altitude is within plus or minus 60 feet of field elevation, and then verify that the two altitudes are within 75 feet of each other, which they were. It was just right there within a couple of feet, so we'll take that as a good check. And then we have a caution. Do not rotate the barometric set knob at a rapid rate or exert force to overcome momentary binding. So, yeah, if we did want to set the altimeter, that would be right here. That's the knob, but I'm just going to put it back to... 2992 leave it now attitude indicators check and set to three degrees nose low so I'm going to come up here to my ADI and just going to rotate this dial I'm going for three degrees nose low now each big tick mark is 10 degrees the smaller ones are five so three degrees nose low is right about there I'm also going to uncage my standby ADI so that's just click it see how do you do it okay click and then rotate I think okay yeah there we go it took a couple of tries but click and rotate I'm going to set this one to 3 degrees nose low as well. That's looking fine. And then canopy and seat safety pins removed. So, okay, canopy jetson pin would come out. The seat ground safety pin would come out. I never did do the, like at the very beginning. Okay, there we go. Now the switch that we have AC power, that switch is working. So I can use that to move my position up and down or sort of reset it to wherever it was. That's fine. Okay, we have a step. Uh, applying to the survival kit, which we're not going to worry about. Wheel brakes apply heavy pressure. Heavy pressure application on both pedals sets the automatic brake adjusters and maintains the minimum pedal. Well, it's not going to matter, but I'm going to do it anyway. I just depress the brakes, and that's just down there depressing the rudder pedals, basically, and I'll release. And then wheel chocks removed, and we're in the taxi. Okay, that came up a lot quicker than I thought it would. Now, let me just on my own pause here and have a look around and see if there was anything I missed or anything else that I want to do here. I'll, I'll be right back. I have a, a feeling that I'm probably missing something here.